heard from the embodiments of English language. Now we're lucky to have the embodiments of corpus linguistics, <laughs> which I think is just marvelous. Tony um, has been behind so many developments at Lancaster University within corpus linguistics and beyond. Uh, and some of them are relevant to this project. I, I could not go through them all, but I'll just offer one. One of the things we have to deal with is the spelling variation in the uh, uh, text that we were dealing with. We, didn't, we, were, we wanted the original spelling. There's so much information in that original spelling. We didn't want a modern edited um, edition, if you like. Tony, I, rem I don't know what you remember, but I remember back in the 1990s sitting in a room with Tony and Jerry Knowles, and we were chewing over this problem, how do you get a computer to deal with spelling <coughs> variation? Uh, I remember that meeting. I didn't move the, the ad initiative forward. Tony did. Later on, Tony and Dawn working on spelling variation, and then, Dawn in the room now, and then the one who really took it uh, to the max is Alistair Barron at the back, who then devised, but I've got a slide, I'll, you'll see this program later, that, that, that uh, really cracked how to regularize spelling. That's just one example. Um, That's good. I've forgotten it all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I, I could list so many, but uh, we're so fortunate to have this part of the project, and also today, speaking to us. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. Actually, that example is a very good one uh, to start with. I'll, I'll make an impromptu comment on those lines. That work was, those comments were stimulated by looking at Daniel Defoe, and he's quite a late variant speller. He's actually relatively uh, prolific in his variant spellings relative to other authors at the time. And we were looking at his letters, and, and it was working on that. And the, Initial ideas for that actually came from some interdisciplinary work. I've been listening to a guy called Peter Willett at Sheffield, who'd been working on the Hartlett papers, in which there was also variant spelling, and he'd started to use some algorithms, and I said, couldn't we use those? So always listen to people in all sorts of subjects. They come up with all sorts of answers that sometimes are interesting. But anyway, that to one side. I'm picking up here, of course, on a theme introduced already by David, uh, the idea that sometimes when you're working with language, especially when it's three or four hundred years old, people say, well, surely by now we know everything, don't we? Is there anything more to find out about that subject? Or we have all of the tools that we need, or all of the information that we need. Why don't you, and often the answer is, well, actually, what some new approach or some new idea is showing us that, in fact, we don't. Uh, sometimes only when we're challenged by people saying, could I do this or could you use that, that we suddenly realize, actually, we don't really know about that. And there's a lot more to find out. So just as a sort of light-hearted uh, introduction to all of the other talks, let me go through four questions. I think they're all relevant to this project in a range of ways. Firstly, you don't need linguists. Secondly, you don't need a lot of data. Uh, we know how to look at grammar anyway, and we know what to look for anyway. So why on earth are you bothering spending money on a people, person like Jonathan, all of his friends, to look at Shakespeare? <laughs> well, we know it all. We know it all. And we know how to look for it. Okay. Well, let's debunk that a little. You don't need linguists. Uh, here's an example from uh, a published paper. I won't say what it is, uh, but it's a paper looking at, I think, Google Engrams, and looking at a sort of cultural history of musical instruments by looking at the words flute, guitar, trumpet, and drum. And they draw these impressive looking graphs. Sometimes they throw impressive mathematics at it as well to sort of baffle you with all of this symbolic capital until finally you wave a little white flag and say, I believe you. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> linguists look at that and say, right there, uh, a word like drum uh, it can be a noun or it can be a verb. It can also have a metaphorical usage. Are they all working in the same way? You're lumping things together here when you're counting. You have those intuitions about language that make you go back and start to question graphs like this. And no amount of mathematics then will convince you that this type of graph is right. And indeed, when you start to look at something like two trumpet, and you look back at trumpet there, trumpet there is the green line it's going down over time. But this metaphorical use of to trumpet is actually going up over time. So we disaggregate it in a way that we understand is meaningful as linguists. We can see patterns which actually are, if you like, averaged away. I have a favorite saying of mine, if you describe everything, you usually describe nothing. In fact, if you look into that everything, you can start to pull it apart into meaningful parts which actually tell you much more. Or we can look at a word like to drum. 
So drum, that can be a verb where you're actually doing the drumming. It can also be metaphorical to drum up support, something like that. Again, if you look at drum there, it's gone up, it's gone down. But if you then try to just look at two drum, that's gone on a steady march upwards. Similarly, we find that with the other words too, but I'm simply illustrating my point that bringing our understanding of language to these questions can lead people away from simple-minded hypotheses based on word forms. Another thing that we can do that's very helpful is to use large volumes of data. Oh, he's at it again. He likes his large <laughs> volumes of data. He's forever adding up that man. Sometimes even just taking away. Okay, so you don't really need a lot of data to move it. So you just need a few telling examples for a critical edition, perhaps, or something like that. Well, no. I'm not saying that you shouldn't look at texts. That would be the last thing that I would say. My own research, as many of you know, is involved in an endless cycle between looking at frequency data and going back and looking at text. In fact, Mary and I were having a conversation about exactly that process before this talk began. We want to see things, but then go back to the texts and verify them. Or we want to see texts, take a question from them and try to see if they scale up. But something like this, for example, uh, the idea that in the 17th century, uh, coffee was called the Mahometan berry, and it was behind a sort of moral panic about Muslims taking over Britain through coffee, uh, has become quite popular. It came from a book by a guy called Matar, who said that this was the case, and then it's gone on from there, and people have started to use this as an idea for how Muslims were talked about in the early modern period. It was all about coffee, and then taking over Britain through their evil brew. This is very widespread. If you go and type Muhammad and Berry into Google, you'll be able to find plenty of theses and books which have taken this example. But if we look in a lot of data, what do we find? No examples of Muhammad and Berry. I looked in the Ebo corpus, Early English Books Online, one billion words of data for the 17th century alone, and Muhammad and Berry isn't mentioned at all. Coffee is mentioned plenty of times. And when people talk about coffee, well, if we use collocation to see the types of things they're talking about coffee in relation to, if you like a sort of rough gist of the meaning of coffee for them, well, it's a rather straightforward one. It's linked with other drinks like brandy, cider, and tea, other intoxicants like tobacco, where it's drunk, for example, coffee houses, and its form, the berry. There are no religion collocates at all. In general English at the time, it's not associated with religion. Turkish does collocate with it as a specific form of coffee. Arab doesn't collocate with it at all, except in the form of Arabic coffee. And again, they're talking about where the coffee is from. It's from the Arabian region. Am I saying that Matar got it totally wrong? No. I suspect that what happened is Matar picked up the one box of documents in which they discuss Mohammed and Berry. That doesn't happen to be in my corpus. And from his one box of documents, he's projected out into the whole of early modern English. I, on the other hand, am looking at a large sample of early modern English and saying, your projection out to early modern English shouldn't have happened. This was peculiar to whatever you found in your shoebox. So it allows us to scope and sometimes restrict or corroborate claims that are made on the basis of close reading. So that's why I'm engaged in this cyclical interaction. OK, then. Right, uh, you've been doing grammar on this project, haven't you? Right, you shouldn't be doing that, because it's all been done. It's all been done. We know about grammar, endless books. You know, that guy, Jeffrey Leach, wrote these big, fat books. My good friend, Dr. Quirk, wrote these big, fat books. There's lots of grammars. We don't need another one. Also, you're using data. Well, you know, there are part of speech taggers nowadays. So why did you have a grammarian looking at it? It's all done by machines now. Artificial intelligence, machine learning will do it all. Well, the problem is that it will indeed do it. Uh, of course, these problems are being worked on. But initially, we took a part of speech tagger which had been given some training, I think it's fair to say, for the 17th century, and applied it to the Ebo corpus, a billion words. I was working with a historian, and Helen said to me, well, one of the claims about prostitutes, because uh, we were writing a book on that topic at the time, is that the word prostitute as a noun really wasn't used of people who engaged in selling sex in the 17th century. And I said, well, that's something we can test quite quickly. I look at prostitutes as a noun, 
and see how it distributes through the century. And if it's the beginning of the 17th century, well, all the historians were wrong. So I gloatingly then produced lots of examples of prostitute from the early 17th century as a noun. But then I looked down the examples. And what did I find? Well, the first example told me the tale, really, which she has determined to prostitute. The program has told me it's a singular common noun, but I, as a linguist, know it is not a singular common noun. So although it appears to be a very good example, and if I didn't critically re-engage with the text, I may have counted it as a good example, I know as a linguist here that it's not an example of a noun. It's an example of a verb. And when I look at the data and I correct it by hand, I find the pattern that I would actually expect to find. The prostitute does go on a really interesting journey, as it were, through the 17th century. It starts off principally as a verb, and it finishes principally as a noun. So it's going through this sort of nominalization process, I suppose you might call it. But the part of speech tagger, for reasons I'll set aside, didn't know that, but he gave firm but incorrect answers. There was no suggestion that this might be wrong. But as linguists, we could see it's wrong. So that's why we need people like Jonathan, people like Paul, people like others, who sit there and actually try to get this right. Language is not static. It is developing through time. And of course, that's what makes it a fascinating object of study in the context of a project like this, and in the context of other work done in historical linguistics. The word forms can remain invariant, but the meaning, the lexical grammar associated with them can change significantly, and we need to understand that. So simply wheeling out old tools and applying it to the past won't work, but you've got a new project like Jonathan's. Oh, semantics, I think I've gone away with that one. Okay, uh, but we need to know what to look for anyway. So somebody might say, you're building a dictionary of sorts, why are you bothering? We have wonderful dictionaries, etc. but why are you bothering building another one? We know which words to look up, and we know what they mean. Well, you can certainly look words up. So in the example I'm about to give you, we looked in the OED, and we looked in Green's Dictionary of Slang. We also looked in early modern dictionaries, and some of you are undoubtedly aware of uh, Leamy, uh, uh, le, le, lexicons of early modern English online, which you can get. And they're wonderful 17th century dictionaries. They're very, very helpful to look at. Curious and difficult to use, but interesting to look at. And also some historical records, because sometimes you can go to British history online or something like that, get historical documents that are dealing with a subject and try to also find out words used to talk about something at that time. And you can build up quite a good list of words to look at. You can also look at the uh, historical source, for example, and get more examples out of that. But people like Mark and others have to work on things like the historical source because corpus data tells you even more. In this example here, from some work we've been doing recently, looking at terms used to refer to venereal disease in early modern English, all of the underlying terms are terms that we found in our corpus which clearly refer to venereal disease, which are not in any of the resources that I mentioned before. They're not cited in the OED, they're not cited in Green, they're not in the early modern English lexicons, etc. But when you look at it, you find that in, the exam in examples where it's clearly relating to somebody who has venereal disease and it is used to mention that. And this is but one example. Every word I've looked at or concept I've looked for in the past has shown again and again that uh, people like Mark are not wasting their time revising this part of the OED. Uh, there's a lot of lexicographic work to be done in early modern English based on these new corpus resources that are becoming available. And that's why, of course, a project like Jonathan's is so important too, because that's part of the picture. If people are looking at Shakespeare, they need uh, dictionary entries that are contextualized for Shakespeare's time. So I've given you just a few ideas there of why we're looking at things, how we're looking at things, how the reactions that people may have to what we may be doing might be so ill-founded that they may suggest that we that shouldn't do it, but in fact, it's really important that we do, because every time we look at a question, the data challenges us to change our way of thinking about it. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, Robert, John, do you have anything you want to...